we're going to talk about art and and resistance uh and obviously mostly when it comes to to palestine and and the palestine struggle and question we've got a a beautiful panel i mean the bios are so big i'm just going to read like one line for each people otherwise it's going to take like 45 minutes um i'm i'm joking but so we've got with us today uh, i'll start with farah farah nabulsi uh she's a filmmaker a bafta winner af mabruk again farah for um a short film called the present who was also nominated uh for the oscars um and uh oh yeah my video just changed and um and had like a huge sort of success and and, and in terms of the outreach it's just been incredible um the film is actually on netflix if you want to see it it's a beautiful film um fara we so happy to have you with us um so um charafna we've also got with us i've said i'll, I'll keep the bio short right because people can go on wikipedia and read them that's not the main point today right the main point is to to hear you and your and your thoughts so we've also got uh, um a friend tamer nafar Tamer is a Palestinian rapper, actor, screenwriter, social activist. He's the founder of the Palestinian band Dam, and he's appeared on on uh, on many films, um, uh, fictions, and documentaries. So, uh, very glad to have you with us again, uh, Tamer. Shukraniktir. We've also got Susan, uh, Susan Abulawa. I hope I pronounce it uh, right. And uh, Susan is a Palestinian. Where are you, Susan? You've just gone from my screen, um, but I'm sure you're here. Yeah, you are. Uh, Susan is a Palestinian American writer and political activist. Uh, you are the author of several uh, very beautiful and successful books, including um, where, including Mornings in Janine, obviously uh, the Blue Between Sky and Water. And you're also the the founder of Playgrounds for for Palestine, an NGO that advocates for Palestinian children uh, by building playgrounds in Palestine and UN refugee camps actually in Lebanon. So um, again, a huge thanks for being with us, Susan. And finally, we've got no wait no that's it that's it right I didn't forget anyone. No, Anne Marie. So, Anne Marie. Oh, Anne Marie, you you're right in front of me, and I thought Anne Marie was like the first as because we don't know each other. That's why I. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea who you are. So sorry, Anne Marie. We've got Anne Marie Jessel with us. Um, she's an award-winning uh, filmmaker. Uh, you're an activist. You um, the founder of Dar Jasser, a cultural center in in Palestine, in Bethlehem. You you'll tell us more about it. Your film includes Soul of the Sea, um, Wajib, uh, When I Saw You. Um, you've got, uh, it's like a bit of a family reunion today. I've got to, I've got to tell people, right? Because I, I can say you're adapting Susan's book, right? That's like not, not secret. Anne Marie, <laughs> right? <No. laughs> it says on the web, right? So Anne Marie is adapting Susan's book. Anne Marie's husband, Osama, has produced Farah's film. So it's, it's, it's all like, it's all, quite cozy uh so um um yeah Anne marie uh Charafna as well uh so glad to see you um and uh now i will uh, pass on the baton to to um abdullah who's gonna sort of start with the first question i guess thanks abdullah yeah thank you so much frank and and thanks to all of you for uh for being here with us this is such a a, a joyous um you know occasion to to be with all of you and to to you know uh ask you questions that we've had for some time just given the fact that all of us are are obviously very big fans and supporters of all of your work but i thought we could start maybe just by asking a very general question which is you know thinking about this particular moment in time that we're all here together um you know having this conversation obviously in the shadow of so many um you know horrific events that have been taking place over the last couple of months or so and so i i kind of wanted to just maybe start by 
uh, asking for your your thoughts or reflections, um, you know, asking how you're doing, how your families are doing, how your your various projects uh, in Palestine. I know all of us have various connections to everything that's happening there. Tamir, you're joining us from from there. Uh, so whether you have any any sort of thoughts or reflections on the most recent events, I know you know we follow you all on social media and have seen that you've been very um, outspoken. But if you have any any thoughts uh, or reflections that you'd like to share. Um, maybe Anne Marie, we could start with you if you have some reflections. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Abdullah, um, and it's good to to be with you with you all. Um, in terms of reflections, um, you know, uh, I I really I, I feel that um, you're right. Things have you know become uh, you know once again you know, very uh, difficult in the last few months. Um, Tamar and I are both in Palestine, um, living in different parts. I'm between Haifa and, and Bethlehem, Bethlehem. Um, and these are two places that uh, are very close to me and I have been affected in different ways, I, I would say. Um, but I, I, I also, you know, it's, it's nothing new. I mean, we've gone through this violence again and again, and it's, 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 a, it's a wave and it comes and it goes. Um, you know, we've, we've lived through more violent times. Um, you know, I, I, I have personally, you know, felt, uh, you know, have lived through much more violent, and I'm talking about particularly about the second intifada where, you know, you know, you, you really fear for your life. Um, and now that's, you know, it's again, the same thing, but in a different way, it's sort of the, it's, it's the, it's the faces, it's the faces of occupation that show itself, um, again and again, um, you know, over the last, you know, 70 years plus, um, that, you know, that it, 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 it comes at you in every way. It comes at you, the violence in the mundane life, the violence in your daily life and the violence in, I mean, it's it's everywhere and it's it, it's everything and it's you know I I bring up Haifa and Bethlehem because Bethlehem of course is in you know what has been come, come to be called the West Bank um, and people sort of associate that with a place that's always um, under violence but it's the the violence of Haifa I've been living in Haifa for five years now and it's uh, a city that. Uh, is the undercurrent of that violence has been bubbling and bubbling and bubbling for years. And it's, you know, it's just another explosion and there will be a calm and there will be an explosion and until, you know, until things are really dealt with in a real way and real justice is, is, uh, happens, you know, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, Tamir, can you talk to us a little bit about you know a lot of us um, outside have been reading and hearing so much about the you know kind of mobilization of the Palestinian citizens of Israel and and, and especially kind of in this most recent um, you know set of events uh, is it unprecedented? I know it's something that tends to be very underreported. We don't really see a lot of discussion around it. Um, we also tend to see it as always kind of purposely and intentionally separated from the broader Palestinian experience elsewhere. Uh, so what can you tell us about sort of what's been happening lately? I can, I can, spe I can speak specifically on, on what is happening in Lid. You know, Lid was very, um, very front page during the event. Uh, and it's a city that it's, I would say 70, 75% uh, Israeli Jews and 25% Palestinians. Um, and somehow, yeah, it did shock the city the way it elevated and escalated. Uh, but now it's calmer on the daily life, but it's still on, يعني, like, uh, it's still on hold in a way because things are happening. Like now the thing that might make it explode again is, Settlers are trying to take over uh, a Palestinian school inside of Lid, and it's escalating. It's it's showing a few confrontations, and and you know just in case something happens and it starts from here, just you are informed already because uh, the taking over that school is it's it's um, it started as a political uh, occupation. I would say, but now it's becoming a bit more rude and um, physical. 
So, um, you know, that's, that's, um, that is what is happening right now before it explodes. Mm. Um, thank you. Uh, Farah, would you like to chime in? Um, chime in. Um, you know, I don't live in Palestine. Um, and I feel like I can speak as sort of a Palestinian on the outside looking in. Um, and I would say that on the ground, of course, things have never been worse. Um, but in some ways, I think these past few weeks have sort of shown us that in the outside world, in the court of world opinion, I see things as potentially getting better. And, and um, I did, I, I penned an opinion piece in The Hollywood Reporter where I spoke to, you know, some of the experiences that have taken place inside, whether it's the very different experiences of 48 Palestinians like Tamir, and I even referenced, you know, his incident of seeing busloads of settlers being pulled out in front of his home to the experience in Gaza and the bombardment there and then to what's happening in Sheikh Jarrah as well as, you know, in, in the West Bank. And, and they're all a bit different and yet all the same, right? It's, it's all this, this system of oppression. But what that did bring to the forefront is this idea of, you know, unity and in, intifada, if you like, um, and and I and I love the idea of that. I mean, and I hope it. I hope something solidifies there. It's something we haven't seen in over a generation, maybe two. Um, that I hope somehow um, continues. Um, under no illusion that somehow this last few weeks was going to solve, uh, you know, anything. But um, I would say that the the speed in which the outside world kind of reacted was very different. Um, and I would say that the conversations that were being had, even on mainstream media, was somehow slightly different. Um, and so it's been a very interesting dynamic um, these past few weeks. But of course, as always, you know, my heart is, is with those on the ground having to, to deal with this unrelenting oppression. No, thank you, Farah. Um, Suzanne, you're not uh, far from me. I'm here in Washington, D.C. I think you're in Philadelphia. Right. Um, have you seen uh, a big change or a shift in the way that Americans in particular, or maybe just the United States overall, has, has been responding to these uh, you know, latest uh, events? Um, well, sure. But I think that um, I think we I think we focus too much on um on the reaction of westerners in general and that you know i um that's not really something that i'm really focused on um but yeah i mean there has in general been um a shift i think um you know what has been steady and growing has been the friendship and solidarity of um nations throughout africa throughout south america um and many asian countries as well um, you know, the, the United States um, is not a friend and has never been a friend. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as the masses, I mean, yeah, sure, there's there's changes there. But I think, in you know, in times like this, um, the sense of exile and dislocation is really amplified for people like me who aren't even, you know, allowed to, to be back home. Um, it, it, we're, you know, we're not experiencing violence directly, uh, but there really, there is uh, a vacuousness, um, an emptiness of not being with, not being home and not being with the, the people uh, we love and want to be with. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I don't, I want I wanted to make a point, but it just escaped my mind kind of at that age. <laughs> um, but I think you no, know, I mean in general, um, it, you know what uh, what's happening to our um, our our people in Palestine um, is 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 just extraordinarily violent, and I. I do want to say how proud I am and how much I support 
the Palestinian fighters and the people who who are holed up in tunnels and um, just to, to offer a minimal amount of protection and resistance um, against Israel. And I think they don't, you know, I, I don't like that they are often maligned and um, uh, and demeaned the way they are when all they're doing is really trying to show some <laughs> some measure of defense. Thank you so much much for that. And I should mention here that if you do remember your point, please feel free at any point to chime in. And that goes for really everyone. I think we, we want this to be as kind of a, a free flowing and open a conversation between all of us. So, so at any point, just feel free to kind of just uh, shout out any, any thoughts or, or, um, you know, points you want to make. Um, I guess a, another question that this brings to mind really has to do with the pressure that's often placed on Palestinian artists. I think probably more so than than any community of artists from any other country in the world, we tend to see this expectation that Palestinian artists will constantly put their art in the service of the Palestinian struggle for liberation. Um, and so I wanted to maybe put the question to all of you in terms of how do you navigate that in terms of just wanting to produce art for art's sake as we constantly hear, you know, these sort of like lofty ideals about sort of what art is supposed to be versus in, in, the, in the kind of unique case of Palestinians that there's this weight of expectations that every Palestinian who's creating something uh, artistically still has to be doing it sort of with some sense of responsibility um, for, you know, the, the, the sort of struggle for uh, Palestine. Um, so, so Diane, maybe I can turn it back to you for that first. Sorry, did you say Suzanne? I did, yes. Oh, Suzanne. Anyway, oh. But, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, I mean, I don't feel, well, I've never felt pressure to, to, you know, to, to, to do art in a, in a certain way. Um, you know, much of our art, much of like art in general comes from sometimes from a place of pain and, and Palestinians exist. I mean, we meet each other in this, in this massive collective wound um, that is that is oppression and occupation and exile and displacement and dismantlement of our culture, and so you know so much of of what I write draws from that you know that that personal and collective angst. It draws from our history. Um, I you know I sometimes you know I write about things that are considered taboo sometimes in our culture, but I've never you know to actually to my surprise I've never. Um, felt uh, a, a serious backlash from our own people at all. Um, that said, you know, Palestinian um, art and culture is, is always, um, or art and culture in general, and in, in, among in people who are engaged in liberation struggles, um, is a pillar of resistance. However, I I don't like our art being seen as tools of resistance. Primarily because, you know, our artistic creations and ex expressions, creative expressions, predate the state of Israel by a few thousand years. Um, and to, to kind of reduce this, these ancient traditions and art forms to something that is uh, primarily in opposition to this, you know, modern day political entity um, does a disservice to our art. We don't, I don't, I think no matter what we write about, if it is always going to be political regardless. Um, for the simple fact that we are a people whose very existence is denied. And by you know, by painting a flower, you know, that's an affirmation of our existence. It's an affirmation of our lives. It's a, it's a connection to, to our ancestors and to our, and to our children. And, um, and I, you know, uh, so that's, you know, that's how, that's how I see cultural production in our society. It's an element of an ancient society that predates Israel. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Tamir, do you have some thoughts on this? Oh, I think you're muted. 
The answer, I mean, my answer is always not planned, but my answer is always depends who's asking it. If it's, if I, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I just noticed that if, if if a Western media or an Israeli media ask says, "What about you do non-political art?" I'll be very defensive that you cannot you cannot delete or block my protest. And when an Arab when an Arab or a Palestinian asks me about, would you? Uh, would you do, uh, why w uh, would you keep doing a, a protest art? I'll be like, I'm allowed to do about love and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it depends who's asking, so I don't know. Um, it's very sad for me that the, this, the, the, the political situation, that the occupation and whatever is happening brought us into this situation where if I want to do just, you know, a, a, a Beverly Hills teenage movie i have to be apologetic about it it's very it's very sad um it's very sad that we always have to be deep and you know i can just be so i can just act stupid i'm allowed um so there you go that's my answers <laughs> fair enough yeah farah same question <laughs> So I, th I think, first of all, we can do both. We can be both. We can, we can do it all. Um, uh, an art critic I, I read uh, said, you cannot make art. Really without sorry, Farah. I, I, I also, I, I also meant we can be both, but it's not happening. We are hardly both. We are almost. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I loved your answer. I'm now, like, yeah, I, 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 I loved your answer. Um, uh, but I, I think we can be both. And I, I, I'm, I'm referring to this art critic who said, you cannot make art without a sense of identity, yet it is identity you seek in making art. Um, and I think that's for anyone in the world, you know. Uh, for me, though at the same time, in many ways, I didn't come from an artistic background. I didn't study film. I didn't work in the industry. So I actually chose to become a filmmaker very much driven by wanting to tell the Palestinian narrative for the reasons of, yes, protest, resistance, um, a purpose-driven filmmaker, if you like. So it came from a very raw place of, of specifically choosing, I'm not here just for the sake of art. Um, and if you look at my website, Native Liberty Productions, um, at the top, I quote um, uh, David Dormino. He's an Italian artist and he does these colossal, incredible bronze sculptures. And, um, and he basically said, true art always had a role and responsibility to take a stand because the fundamental role of the artist is to help people shape their point of view in a way that liberates us. Otherwise, art just has this sort of aesthetic function to it in that sense. Now, obviously, he's referring to his art, but to me, that resonates. So um, ultimately, there's a side to me that is, is, is going where my creativity takes me. I'm excited about that. Um, and I will and do look at certain things now that aren't necessarily Palestine related or... Um, or politically driven in that sense of, uh, you know, our narrative, and it could be art for the sake of art, but very much I'm, I'm driven by, by what my identity is drawn to and what's important to me as a human being, as a, as a Palestinian as well, and as someone who wants to do, you know, work that does have that sort of deeper meaning when it comes to our struggle and injustice. And I always say that if everything Palestine was resolved, I'd like to think I would use my art to champion something else. But if not a Palestinian for Palestinians, then who? So that's how I see it. Um, but we should be free to, to, to express ourselves in any way. And um, it's, I think it's a choice and uh, we can do both. Uh, thank you, uh, Anne-Marie. Yeah. Um you know, they talk about the, I mean, let's talk about the burden of what they call the burden of representation. And I think that's an interesting phrase because I don't feel that I have any burden um, when I make my art and I make my work. And I definitely don't represent anything. I don't represent Palestine or Palestinians or anything. Um, there are, uh, you know, a million billion stories and a billion ways ways to do them and i think the danger is when when an artist thinks that they need to represent something or when an artist needs to have a message um, messaging is is to me failed art um 
and and I really like Susie. Uh, Susie, I think Susie said it so perfectly. I mean, you always you you always have a way with words, both on the page and and spoken. And I, and I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I think that one position that Palestinian Palestinians sometimes, you know, us as artists and as um, as writers, as as people, and anything, is that there's this idea that you know, we must do something for, like, sort of to prove who, you know, prove that we are human. And I, I, I can't, I mean, this for me is such a despicable idea. The idea that we have to humanize ourselves, or we do things to humanize, I'm going to humanize the Palestinians, I'm going to, human it's so insulting. It's so, I mean, I think, like, if, if we're having a conversation between us as artists, and, and as, you know, people, as creators, as creative people, um, you know, we've, we've got to do away with that. I mean, we, we, you know, we've got to do away with that. We are, that it is, it's, it's, it's like going, throwing ourselves backwards, 100 years. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot, it's a, you know, you're asking a big question here and I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, it's, it, you know, what, and what is, you know, this whole question always, what is political? I mean, what is not political? Can we do both? There is no both. There is only one thing. It is us. It is who we are. It is our lives. Um, you know, we don't, you don't, I don't think that anyone chooses, uh, you know, this or, I mean, you, you, you make what, you know, you are honest, you tell an on, honest story, you, 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 you have to be true to your soul. And it's, that's, that is what, uh, that is the, that is the best we can do. I, I just want to chime in there. Um, you know, yeah, you, you, you tell your truth, of course, and you're as honest as you can be, but also I think ignoring the fact again, that, we know, we know that this beast of Zionism, like with every colonial enterprise that ever existed, works extremely hard to dehumanize. As with every other colonial system in history, to dehumanize and then brand as barbarians and then deny we ever existed, like Susie had said, denial of our existence. So to ignore that and sort of go, oh, you know, if any part of the artistic role were to rehumanize, that somehow we failed in our art. I, I, I disagree with that. I think that ultimately it's very terrible that that would be something we'd have to consider. But surely it is required in many ways. And this is what, where we talk about art of resistance and theater of resistance. And it is... It is about telling our narrative in a way that reverses all the damage done, uh, whether it came to, you know, South African apartheid and the use of art to, to, to tell the narrative. And so ultimately, I think there is a bit of responsibility in that. And, but we uh, were never not human. Of course I mean, not. We were That's never not true. humanized. That's yes, the point. No, that, but when you, when you but, it's, it's but about centering, centering yourself. We were never not humanized. Why should we humanize ourselves or rehumanize ourselves or whatever? I don't care who, do, you know, we are human okay. and we have, to, we have to center our own voices and we cannot react to I what other people, really people say. I think reacting, as, reacting is not the right yeah, yeah, I'm I'm jump in here. Reacting. I, anyway, the, the, the perspective being we cannot just ignore the fact that we have been seriously dehumanized. So we could choose oh. to use our arts in different ways. So if, if one wants to tell a story where they're not focusing, um, you know, on, on, on a reality, on the reality of the situation, that's, that's fine. I'm not saying we weren't ever human or that we're not human. Of course not. But the fact is we have been the victims of that. So... Some people will use their arts recognizing that and maybe others won't. And, and maybe that's where maybe we're different as artists. But I perceive that when I'm telling certain Palestinian stories, I'm aware. I'm not saying I'm contriving anything, but I'm aware that, you know, depending again on which audience as well that you're, you know, ultimately going to be putting your art in front of. It's something else to say, I'm making art purely for my own self-satisfaction and I only anticipate an audience for, of myself that's different. And, 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 you know, all respect for that. There are some artists who make art just to hang on their walls, for example, for themselves. 
different you know so i think artists do different things with different right 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 but that's a different question i mean i don't think we're talking about audience which is another question to talk about but uh susie you had you were trying to say something um i have kind of i have a similar reaction um or, or rather distaste for the word humanizing um and and i you know i agree Fada. like every artist has a different has a different approach um and we sh you know and that's that's good and healthy and normal um but there is there is this kind of you know sometimes readers or you know others um will will talk about you know writing to humanize palestinians and and it's it is insulting and it does feel racist to me because for, on several on several levels number one it it does sort of have this underlying assumption that there's some merit to the dehumanization it also implies that it, it's it's our job to to prove our humanity to people who think we are inferior somehow um when i you know because i write in english i i'm well aware that my first readers are english people who are literate in English. I'm, you know, I'm not stupid. I, I understand that. But I never write for English speaking people. Um, I never write for Westerners. And I think, and and this is just, this is just my process personally, because I think when, when I, if, if I were to write for any audience, um, I think that I will, I would, my art would lose something. Um, I'm writing for uh, well, my only loyalty really is to the characters and to tell their their story with authenticity and, and truth and and texture and color and life. Um, but that by default means, because my characters are Palestinian, by default that means that I'm writing for Palestinians. Um, I'm writing, I want to write something that my grandmother would be proud of and that my you know, generations yet to come would be proud of Palestinian, Palestinian, Palestinians. Um, so I do think, um, I, I, I feel like when we do think about this sort of Western dehumanization and that whole discourse that it, it starts to formulate our, um, outward facing conversation. It starts to make it very Anglophile and anglocentric rather or eurocentric um and i think we i think we lose ourselves a little bit in in trying to reach people who already hold us hold our lives in contempt so so i don't really even like engaging in those conversations to be honest i mean i just feel like hey like you want to have that conversation read my books like i'm not i'm not gonna do this Thank you all for that so much. Uh, Frank, go ahead. Yeah, it's just yeah no, I, was, I was going to say, maybe Tamer wants to say something. No, go, 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 Tamer. It just, it's, it's, for me, it's not about humanizing or not humanizing. For me, it's about that, that, that uh, overthinking of even if I want to do a love song, I will have like, uh, like, the, 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 like, uh, al Bahar, for example. It's, it's, it's a love song if you think of it. Yeah. Uh, it's a love tongue, but but we are tied. Uh, we are tied by decision, by a choice. But it's there. Even 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 when you say people have a choice, I agree. But some people have tens of choices, and some people have only two choices. So it's it's not that. So it, it, Junction Forty Eight is supposed to be a love song, but but we had that the house demolition. That so it's. I don't think we do have a we have a choice of non-choices and it just reminds me of that i'm, I'm not i'm, I'm not uh, i'm not, I'm not gonna, gonna address movies it's just it just reminds me of one of the songs uh Yaret for the movie uh, junction 48 where it really starts Yaret means um i wish i i wish i could love you i, I wish i could write you a love song full of cliches that's all i want i wish <laughs> i can do that i wish we can kiss under the rain uh, but I fucking hate the rain because the rain reminds me of my leaking roof because I don't have money. So I forgot about the song. And I, so yeah. it's yeah. just, it's just, I think that the Palestine, I think 
It's not about humanizing or not. It's just about not, uh, people humanizing us or not. It's just about feeling light and to feel as human being, us as ourselves. Because as much as we are human, we are not being tr- treated as human beings. That's that's something as well. Mm. And I think uh, uh, it, it, for people who doesn't do political art or protest art, you really have to be in a privileged um, situation. So it's, for me, it's not about just humanizing or not humanizing. Uh, I, I, I really agree. I don't have to, to prove to anyone that I'm a human being, but on my daily life, on the racist rules of the way the police are looking at me, I'm not being treated as a human being. So it does affect my art. To, it, does, it does spice my art in a way. I actually wanted to, to, to touch upon this. We, we've, been, we've been talking about humanizing or dehumanizing, but Palestinians are faced with another issue, right? And they've been faced with the same issue since pre-48, which is um, a colonial power, like all, all colonial power do, wanted to, to disappear them. And in a way, uh, history has taught us that to disappear people, you first erased their common past, their culture, the art. Um, I mean, in 48, uh, there was um, something called the Great Book Robbery, where Israel, one of the first things they did was, you know, steal every every books that Palestinians had. And, uh, and a friend, Hadak Karmi, actually um, wrote about this. And I think a documentary has been made about this. Uh, for example, Dar Jasser was raided by the Israeli army about what, a, a month ago. So... The question, it goes even further than humanizing a people, right? When you are faced with a power that wants to erase you. I was wondering if you wanted to comment on this. Me? Dr. Jason? Or? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, Dar Jasser, so for those who don't know, is, is, uh, is you know, our family home, but it's a, it's a cultural space in, in um, Bethlehem, and it was raided by the Israeli army. Um, they ransacked the place. They stole the hard drives. They smashed up the house. I mean, it you know, it's it's uh, was you know uh, something we're 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 still we're in the middle of now is 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 you know um, renovating and restoring and rebuilding. But Palestinians rebuilding is in our DNA exactly like it's been going on for so long, and we're used to it. And it's not the first time. It's not the last time. And we're so much for me. I mean, I I always have to remember what. I, I, I always remember the privilege I have in all aspects of my life um, and that we're in such a better place than so many others. Um, and I think I'm talking specifically right now about Gaza and what's happening in those places. I mean, um, but, you know, the fact that Dar Jasser was ransacked is also, like you said, I mean, it's a history of um, this erasure of our culture. Um, almost every cultural institution um, in the West Bank has been raided. Um, and we knew, I mean, you know, the, the hard drives were taken. What do they want with our hard drives? I mean, but that's what they do. They, every single institution, they go and they take the hard drives. It's always the hard drives. And then they smash other things and they take other things. What's going on with the hard drives? You know, we know. Um, and and our, our whole existence has been exactly that, is, is that, you know, everything has been erased. And I think that's why, um, when you are born Palestinian, you quickly learn to read between the lines. You always know that there's something missing, that there's something we have this, this you know, this, uh, you know, whatever secondhand, uh, you know, instinct that, that, that I'm always looking for the other side of the story. I'm always looking for more because I know what happens when things are removed, um, you know, and, and from, from the picture. And I, uh, you know, that's... That's uh, that's something that is you know shown. It's it's ugly. It's the ugly face, another ugly face of, of occupation that is that has existed in the silencing of our artists. I think it's you know we, we we always have to talk about the generation in front of us. The generation in front of us, the generation now, is remains it continues to be silenced. But the generation in front of us, I mean, I think it's important to 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 always put that in the in the forefront. They they were silenced. They were killed. They were, I mean, the stories, and it's it's still happening today. The conversations are behind the scenes, and we know it. And when we talk about it, people may, who maybe are not so familiar think it's a bit paranoid. But there is a real system that is still 
happening today. You talk, I mean, we we're talking, you, you started off specifically about, you know, the, the Israeli army and, and, you know, Dar Jasser, but I'm not just talking about the Israeli apartheid system, but also a system in the world in which our, we are still, our voices are still being silenced, whether it's festivals, funding, um, publishing houses, you know, it's, it's all over. And every single, I don't know a Palestinian artist who has not been confronted um, with that attempt of, of silencing or changing our, our language in order to, you know, yeah. go through. Yeah. And I think coupled with that, with, um, with the erasure and the silencing is appropriation. Um, yeah. So on the one hand, there's, you know, <clears throat> um, all kinds of, uh, you know, <laughs> theft of hard drives, silencing, intimidation, um, then there's uh, uh, this sort of rapacious desire to indigenize themselves, you know, foreigners who really have no relationship with the land, no familial connection whatsoever, and no common culture that unites them, none whatsoever. And so, you know, the, the only thing they have is what was already there, what was created by Palestinians. And so you see all these um, now... Uh, this, you know, Israeli tatris, um, you know, a blue and white kofia, uh, and of course, the theft of food. I mean, there is, there's just, there's actually a really big kind of explosive thing happening right now in Philadelphia. There's a festival, or it's kind of, it's called um, uh, Eat, uh, Eat Up the Borders, um, where community activists just kind of invite food trucks from, you know, just representing food from all over the world. And, you know, following some conversations with community members, they disinvited um, a, a, an Israeli food truck that was basically peddling, you know, shawarma, hummus, falafel, um, you know, everything that we grew up on. <laughs> and, uh, and, and they, uh, Zionists, have mobilized this extraordinary intimidation machine against these activists and the and and also bringing down the weight of the state on them um and there's you know cries of anti-semitism and exclusion and and you know um violence from you know for, it's just and it has and it, it has exploded into this really anti palestinian narrative of that that we are somehow sort of that we are the aggressors. And, and I always marvel how, how they manage to do that, actually. You know, here's this sort of, uh, you know, this, this nuclear nation with the most sophisticated death machines in the world uh, and one of the, the worst and best documented records of human rights abuses and, uh, and violence against the indigenous people somehow managed to put themselves in a position of, of being vic our victims. It's extraordinary and it's playing out now, but it's about, it's about cultural appropriation. Um, and so I think that, yeah, I do feel sort of sometimes protective of our culture. I feel defensive. I feel defensive over homeless. You know, I feel this is <laughs> our kafia, you know, like get, get your fucking, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop. But yeah, like I, I, and I think, I think all Palestinian cultural workers feel this kind of, you know, uh, um, you know, it's, um, so yeah, I'll just, I'll stop. <laughs> no, thank you so much for that, Susan. I think, I mean, this really brings up, um, a question for me about just how daunting it can be sometimes to, you know, think about the, the layer upon layer upon layer of oppression and suffering that Palestinians have had to endure and how you've, you've managed to kind of convey that a lot throughout your work. I mean, when we think about sort of like the way that the beginnings, right, that, that 48 always uh, evokes a certain kind of, you know, all roads lead back to that. And of course it leads back earlier than that really um, to, you know, the late 19th and early 20th century and Balfour and all of that. But the idea of having to kind of convey the sense of uh, a compounded, set of of kind of suffering the dispossession that occurs the initial crime and then everything that's that's made to kind of cover up that initial crime that goes on for the next you know half century and then 70 and 80 years and so how do you deal with that in terms of trying to tell stories that end up being the sort of like 
um, you know, a, a kind of set of extremely layered, uh, you know, suffering that goes into multiple generations. You have this this one line, I think, in Mornings of Janine, this character who's, who says, imperialism by the inch, right? That This idea of, of showing how piecemeal of a process it is. It's not just about the wars. It's not just the years that we think of, of, you know, 48 and 67, and 82. It's everything that happens in between as well. Um, how do you manage to, to face that challenge when you're, you're sort of trying to kind of weave narrative together and capture everything that happens beyond the kind of, um, you know, the, the milestone events and these sort of uh, the, the kind of big picture explosions and everything else in between? It's a big question, I know. I was trying to kind of think of how to say it, but I, I hope something there made sense. If I, I could, I'd like to hear from Farah, actually, because I, I wanted to say that her, your film, you know, it was so simple, but it, but it captured everything between the lines. Um, you know, uh, it, it captures so many uns without, without ever being explicit. Um, and Emery, you do that in your work too so i mean i i'm a you know i'm i really marvel at film so i i mean i'd <laughs> i'd love to hear uh, from you guys um thank you um i mean i i can't so so really it's not an answer to what you asked abdallah from my end because i i haven't done the sort of generational you know, um, captured it generationally. For me, the present being the gift and the present time, really. So, so this was, this was. Let's put all history aside. Let's talk about what's happening right now. And and then, as you said, don't mention the word occupation. Don't mention the word apartheid. But it's there to to see. Um, and it doesn't take a genius to see it in, in what is a very simple story. Um, and I, I think that was the point. It was. You know, there's so much more that happens, of course, in, in, in Palestine under this horrible system of control and oppression. And, and this is, you know, one checkpoint, one, one man and his daughter, but representative so much more. And it, it, it's, it's quite shocking how it's resonated so much internationally. Um, and I think it's because it is such a basic part of life, this idea of a freedom of movement, you know, and, 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 and it wasn't focusing on all the other atrocities that take place even at checkpoints, let alone elsewhere, whether it's home demolitions and so forth. But by focusing on something that is so simple, um, just meant that it was so much more relatable, I think, for, for, for everybody. Um, and, you know, it's film, right? They say show, don't tell and all of that. So I guess that's, that's the way, you know, it was approached. And, and here we are. So, and, and Anne Marie, of course, your your first film, I think, like Twenty Impossibles, was also about a checkpoint experience. I mean, back in two thousand three, and I, I thought that was kind of interesting to see both of these films, you know, set you know eighteen years apart, and yet it's still the same kind of experience. So maybe you can talk a little bit about sort of what went into thinking about this as being, uh, you know, a scene for. Um, trying to showcase the kind of the, the Palestinian experience in this in this one um, in this this kind of one everyday experience with checkpoints. Um, yeah, I'm I'm always interested in 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 the mundane. I'm I'm always interested in in that place. Um, it's it's never the extreme. It's never the the black and white because what's happening in Palestine, as we all know, is so much worse. Um, you know, like Twenty Impossibles was actually shot in two thousand and one, and it was at the height mm. of you know real violence. Um, I mean, the army. I mean, we were hiding in our bathrooms, and there was you know F sixteens, you know, dropping bombs, um, and it was terrifying. And that film came out of that, um, which is that you don't really see any of that um, because it's so clear to me how wrong that is. And I'm interested in, 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 a, in work myself that is, you know, more about that gray area, that, that the, the violence of humiliation. Humiliation, and it's the same thing with, with uh, Tamar brought up Salt of the Sea, that, that 
opening scene at the airport when Soraya is strip searched, um, that the humiliation of that, um, you know, the fact is when people watch that, they're like, oh my God, that's awful. Like that, that's, you know, does that happen to you? I'm like, that, every time, I mean, we, we know that every time we come in and out, that happens to us, but actually it's much worse what happens to us. What my, you know, my experiences there have been much worse. Um, my, my very early formation of my consciousness as a Palestinian came at the you know, checkpoints and at the bridge when, you know, st being strip searched with my entire family. Um, it's so much less than what is in the opening scene of Salt of the Sea. But when you do that, then they're like, oh, you've gone, you know, you're going to, you know, it's this feeling you've gone too far, like you're exaggerating. When we, we all know, anyone who's gone through it knows it's not an, an, an exaggeration. Um, but, you know, and, and then, yeah, I mean, like 20 Impossibles is, in, is, in, is, is something that, was also all about our identity, how we were all, how we, we, are, we were, it was right at the, you know, it was Oslo. It was a reaction to Oslo, how we were suddenly, you know, we, we had been living, being split up from each other with the colors of our license plates and all this, you know, the colors of our IDs. And then there was this thing where, oh, if you were a 48 or if you were a Jerusalem, if you were, you know, Palestinian, you know, from the diaspora, if you were this, like everybody's different IDs enabled them different privileges and different things that they could do and places they could or not. And the film was really about, about, you know, a group of Palestinians who are all Palestinian and they live, you know, in a certain place, but because of their, you know, ID cards, et cetera, they, they, they were split up and they're, you know, in, in this, in the case of the 20 impossible a film crew. Um, and, and it was, you know, actually since, you know, there was a barrage, I mean, there was like nothing but checkpoint films from Palestine for a period. There's, you know, there, there's been a lot of writing on that. George Khalife writes about that. He calls them, he calls them a, it became a genre in Palestinian cinema, the checkpoint films. And there's, there's probably 150 of them. I mean, um, and, you know, it was, it's a visual way to represent what's happening. That's the strength of the checkpoint. So, you know, we, you know, we, we build our checkpoints. We, I mean, it's weird. We, 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 we are creating, you know, checkpoints now as filmmakers in order to, to film them. Um, and we've got some really amazing checkpoints that are huge. We, we, we made Kalandia and Salt of the Sea, or it's like a flying checkpoint, like in, you know, like 20 Impossibles. I, I think there's something very humorous about the fact that we are, we, we, the way we rebuild our own, you know, oppression and the way we represent it on screen. Like when, you know, you have, you know, people playing soldiers um, in Salt of the Sea, they were all either Palestinians or anti Zionist, um, you know, Jews who had actually refused to be in the army. Some of them had gone to jail because they didn't want to be in the army, but they were, they were putting on uniforms to, you know, be soldiers in, in, uh, you know, salt of the sea. Um, at the end, I thank you, Tamar, for what you said, because I think that's exactly salt of the sea was just a love story. It's a, for me, it was always, a, it's, it is nothing more than a love story, but because of, you know, what the, the reality of our lives that's re that's just our that's the, there is no such thing as just you know just a just a love story but the heart of it is that and i think if you look at, at a lot of palestinian cinema you see that elise Lehman's film um uh divine intervention is a love story it's it's simply that it's about two people who are separated from each other because they live in different you know places two palestinians because they have you know different id cards um so yeah, just you know, a, a long way to 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 answer you, but to go back to to the thing about representation and and you know, Palis people are terrified of the Palestinian voice. Um, people are scared of the Palestinian voice, and you know, it's a it's appropriation, as as Susie said, and it's this thing to to be made invisible. And I and I and I go back to. You know, you talk, I just, you were, when you were talking about the food trucks, it's, I, I was thinking about that. And I was remembering in New York, when I lived in New York and we did the, the first Palestinian film festival in New York, which was created because nobody is seeing these stories. There's, there's, a, we have a, you know, nobody is, is watching these films. So we gathered all these Palestinian films, 40 Palestinian films, and they screened in New York for the first time. 
Um, there are people making films in Gaza that nobody knows about and nobody sees. There are people making films in, in Janine. There are people making films. We don't know them because, you know, they don't have the connections. They don't have the money. They don't have the you know, ability to study film abroad or they don't have, you know, whatever the reasons are. Nobody sees these works and there's so much of it. So we got it. We gathered these films and it was crazy. The reaction was that that we were faced with is that we were we received death threats on a daily basis it wasn't just that people were against the festival we got death threats we had to call the new york you know police department and we had to be escorted we were festival organizers i mean that's how ridiculous the palestinian experience is that you are organizing a film festival to screen films and you need police protection to walk you know from your you know your office to the subway and that is, you know, the reality of, of, of Palestinian existence. But I think maybe it's because through films, I mean, for me, like Palestine, the question of Palestine is also about images and realities, right? Uh, and images for, for people like me, who before 2007 never set foot in Palestine was, you know, what you see in the media and stuff. And then you go there and the real, sort of the reality hits you and i think maybe the response uh, about the film festival is because you were you were challenging a very powerful myth right about israel as as susan mentioned as this you know david versus goliath this victim of uh, you know surrounded by you know arab states and enemies and uh, a quick thing i remember when i went to palestine in 2007 i i went to checkpoint 300 i think the one in bethlehem the, the big ones and um i was with jeff Halper actually from from icad and jeff told me you know if you if you want to go through it you've got to you know queue from 3 a.m you gotta you know and so i woke up at 3 a.m i went there and the sh the the number of people that you know you know really people like cattle right like shocked me so much that you know I, I felt like puking and stuff and i i, I just couldn't stand it and i went back to the house in Bejala or whatever and 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 then one day i went back to the checkpoint and it was totally empty i think it was 3 p.m or something and i filmed it i had my camera and i filmed from the start of the checkpoint till the end of the checkpoint and then i when i edited it i accelerated the thing and i think it lasted the film is about six minutes long and there's no one in the checkpoint and it's you know and i showed it to people in europe and people were shocked they were like what is this is it a terminal app uh, you know an airport like a terminal in an airport or something else no no that's a checkpoint and it's empty and the film is like you know i speeded it up if you go there at 3 a.m it takes like three or four hours so i think that's the thing right about challenging this myth that we've all been fed with about about Israel and I think that art and culture and that's what films are, are weapons in a way and and books and music because they're very dangerous for for colonial state um such as Israel and its you know supporters like the US Europe and the rest so it's not really a question but yeah Farah yeah, I want to chime in here. Um, so first of all, you know, Checkpoint 300, I, you know, I don't know if you made the connection, but that's scene two of the present. That was Checkpoint 300. And I had a very similar experience where I decided to go in the dead of night and I went through it and went, what the hell is this? And, you know, um, what I find interesting is that, you know, I, I kind of came to this conclusion that similar to you, Frank, um, you know, despite for me, everything I thought I knew and having gone there many times as a child, it was going there and seeing the reality on the ground with my own two eyes, okay, that made a huge seismic shift in me. And every, every Western I've ever met who is probably more active and more passionate about Palestinian freedom and justice than actually probably most of the Palestinians and Arabs I've ever met are because they went and they saw what was going on, right? So then I sit there and I think to myself, so if we really wanted to really solve this, you know, other than obviously internally getting our house in order, let's put that aside. I'm talking about, you know, the world moving in a social movement to bring change. It would be to bring millions of people to the ground to see with their own two eyes what's going on. Now, obviously, that's just an economical, logistical, uh, decades-long impossibility in that sense. But what is the next best 
extremely powerful, cost-effective, time-effective, um, and achievable alternative is bring Palestine to them, whether it's through film, through music, through art, through everything you just said, culture, art. And, and so in that sense, I, I feel like that is, you know, to me, one of the most powerful elements of art. Um, you know, I, I always say we can have all of our, our truths and our proofs and our facts and our figures and our maps. But ultimately, who, 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 who's going to pay attention to that? You have to speak to people's hearts to access their minds for anyone to take any action for any cause, let alone the Palestinian cause, the Palestinian struggle. So, you know, I think, I think art is, is in so many ways everything. <laughs> Have you all frozen? I'm if no one, no one else wants, wants to sort of jump in, I, w I want you to ask something about art and, and the power of art, because I think we, we shouldn't underst under underestimate the power of art, but we shouldn't either think that art's going to change everything and, you know, make everything better in Palestine. Because, like, I'm, 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 I was thinking of, uh, like, Palestinian films that have made, like, sort of big news over the last 10 years. So, you know, there was Paradise Now, Five Broken Cameras, Omar, um, uh, The Assault of the, the Sea, actually, The Present. Um, but I feel like, I remember for Five Broken Cameras, like, Michael Moore pushing Five Broken Cameras. I remember Robert De Niro going to the opening of the film and, and people going, wow, this is going to be, like, such a change. You know, this film is going to change a lot, right? And then... How long ago was Fiber Con Cameras? At least 10 years ago, right? Or more. And, and, and then, I mean, the present, let's say, the present comes and, and it's everywhere and Netflix and, and it's, it wins a BAFTA and, and, and we're thinking, well, we're opening a door here. You know, there's, there's something new, but we need more, right? We right. need a lot more. Yeah, yeah, go, go. Ultimately, no one film is ever going to solve this either. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's the collective, it's the continuous, and it's also things working in tandem. You've got to be engaging and you've got, you're, you're, you're speaking to people through art, of course, and that's part of it. And then you've got the sort of NGOs and you've got the movements, you've got the solidarity campaigns, you've got ultimately what should be, and I'd love to see a proper social movement um, around this, this struggle, but it's, you know, it's never an on off button. It's, it's a dimmer switch. It takes time. So each, each, each film, each book, each along the way contributes in the conversation in the, you know, but it is a gradual process. I mean, it's not about, and it's kind of naive if we think that, you know, any one film is suddenly going to change the, the, the situation, but at the same time, that's what allows for the engagement, the conversations, and the movement towards, ultimately, a, 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 a bigger movement and, and action. But what I'm trying to say is without the art, without that engagement, you're asking, you're, you're thinking and hoping that things will get solved on the back of, yes, the real facts and figures and numbers and proofs and truths. But ultimately, that's not how it works. And any social movement will attest to that. You know, ultimately, you have to engage. And, and, and the way to engage is through the heart first. And that's, art does that. You access people's okay, minds. Maybe. Studies have shown that. You can show people proofs that contradict something they've repeatedly been told or made to believe. And they'll stick to their beliefs. But those same studies show if you can bring people to empathize, if, they, if you can address them through their hearts over the same subjects and beliefs, they become... Uh, they move away from their original positions. And so ultimately, empathy is through art. That they're, you know, there's no question about that. So that's what I meant. If I can maybe just ask a, a bit of a flip side of that, uh, of that question. And, and this has to do with the cultural boycott. Of course, you know, as Palestinians have, have uh, attested and asserted time and again that they believe that that the boycotts, divestment, sanctions movement is seen as, you know, a, a very important tool in the struggle for Palestinian liberation. 
Um, you know, and then occasionally you'll come across these uh, sort of like liberal voices, especially in, obviously in the West, in the US and Europe, who will say, you know, oh, we, su we support it. We support it economically. We support it in all of these different spheres, but we don't support it in terms of a cultural boycott, because we think that it is that kind of exchange that's going to be important in order to change minds within the Israeli public. And, and so this is the kind of argument that I'm wondering whether you've encountered this idea, because of course, as we know, the cultural boycott is a very crucial component of this movement. And of course, we've seen that it, it did have a tremendous impact in the South African model. Um, so I wonder in terms of how you've uh, sort of navigated those kinds of questions when they get raised as far as why the cultural boycott in particular is important. So whoever, whoever would like to take that one. Um, I think that the um, uh, people who, you know, who sort of engage in that, that discourse that, oh, well, culture is different. It's what brings people together are operating from that privileged position that Tamir mentioned earlier. I mean, people who think that there can be a disconnect between um, struggle and art or, or art and, 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 and politics um, are typically operating from, um, from a position of luxury or people who've never really been engaged in, who've never been oppressed and, and have never had to fight for, you know, the simple dignity of, of home or, or for their lives for that matter. Um, I think it's important to, to disengage from Israel in every way. I mean, anyone who, who stands in solidarity with Palestinians um, should not be lending their name to, uh, uh, to Israel. We all, we all know that Israel uses art to, um, to, to cloak uh, uh, genocide, essentially. Um, so that's kind of a bogus argument. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm, I'm a... a, a, a big supporter of the cultural boycott. Um, I <clears throat> did not allow my um, books to be um, translated in Israel, not because I, I don't want them to be translated in Hebrew. I consider Hebrew an indigenous language in Palestine, but I don't, um, I don't uh, want to engage with an Israeli publishing house. <clears throat> so, um, but I want to just, you know, back to Farah's point, about you know the art kind of you know offering kind of a service to um to change people's minds i just um i mean I, you know there's definitely there's merit to that no doubt but i can't i always kind of recoil from that a little bit and because i just um i just i think having um art that it, it, it producing art with the purpose of that kind of loses loses something for me um and we also kind of when we focus on changing you know changing minds we also kind of lose um sense of ourselves like for example one of like among like the the, the letters i've gotten from readers that i'm that I, that moved me the most were letters from uh, two Palestinian women in different places. One was in the U.S. and one was in 48. And both of them basically said the same thing to me. They were like, you know, the, until we read your novel, we never really understood our father or our grandfather. It was just along those lines. And, you know, these, and we kind of, you know, we forget our responsibility to, the, to our own, to our own, to ourselves, to our own society. Um, and that's more important to me, honestly. I think art, Yes, art can serve a lot of purposes and, and, you know, you can use it in service of whatever you want. But ultimately, it is, to me, it's, it's kind of a glue in our society. Um, we are so fragmented uh, as a result of the geographic fragmentation that was imposed on us by, by our occupiers. And that geographic fragmentation has resulted in psychological boundaries, linguistic boundaries, um, political boundaries, but we 
you know, the, we can, st art, our art is common, our anguish is common, our, the original wound that we experience as a society is, are all things that we have in common, and our art can come from these places and bind us and, and create these bridges and, um, and, and sort of address the fragmentation that we all experience. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Just to add to that, I totally agree with that, of course. And that's something wonderful and beautiful about art as well, and, and without a doubt, without a doubt. And, you know, equally so. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll get emails from Palestinians also, though, saying, you know, with the present, thank you, I've been seen. I think that's very important, too. I think yeah, that's... No, I agree with that, and I, and I completely reiterate that with the present. Yeah. Be seen. Yeah. You know, and feel like in that sense, I've been seen and thank you. That's me. I was Yusuf yesterday. And, you know, so ultimately, I, 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 I don't think there's any, I think we're, we're on the same page here, except that, you know, one chooses where their art maybe works or resonates more internally, what their choices and also externally. So, but yeah, I agree with what you've just no, said. No, absolutely. I wasn't. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate that, like, I, I do agree with you, and, and actually the impact of the present um, and, and other Oscar nominations before that, I think, you know, while what you said, Frank, that, uh, you know, they didn't have the wow impact that, that you expected, I think it's, I think they did. I think that's why we're in this position. I think, yeah. you know, the, the, the films that came before the present paved the way for the present. Everything we do paves the way for, for the next generation, for the next artist. Um, and that's how struggle works. That's how liberation works. There's never, or rarely, I should say, uh, you know, a, a wow moment. Um, and when it does come, it comes because there were decades of work. I mean, when you, when you think about, you know, black liberation in this country, you know, uh, uh, millions of, of enslaved people struggled um, and never got to see the fruits of their struggle. They never got to see liberation, but it was the generations after them who did. When you think of the impact of writers like James Baldwin and Toni Morrison, um, Octavia Butler, and, and so many Black writers in this country and the impact that they had uh, on, on, uh, on, the, on Black liberation struggles. I mean, it's just so I think it's all cumulative. You know, we all build, we, we stand on, on sturdy shoulders that came before us and, and, and we create whatever we can for, for the ones who come after us to, to stand taller. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I totally, I think that's exactly it. It's, it's, um, it's, it's the key. It's, it's cumulative. It's, um, there, there is no, exactly, there is no wow moment. I mean, you know, it, Palestinian, you know, films, Palestinian writers, I mean, all of that, the, the, the biggest awards when, you know, uh, Palestinian artists wins the Golden Lion at Venice, um, you know, that's, you know, there's, there, there's so much when, you know, Palestinian filmmakers have been, you know, winning at Cannes at, you know, the top festivals in the world when, you know, Hania Basad was nominated for, for um, you know, the Oscars. Um, for the, with his first film that came after Elise Sleiman was not able to enter his film and the Oscars. We have to always remember that somebody is knocking every door, every door. Each one of us are, are, are scraping at doors to, in order to make every single moment possible. And, and there's no way not to, to, you know, look at that and know that you are where you are because of who what has happened before you, which has been a massive, massive struggle and, and one that is, that is, you know, um, still going on. And I guess is that more, you know, I've, I think for me, I'm, I'm, it's our audience that's interesting to me because those have been the best screenings. Those have been the most meaningful moments in my career. It wasn't, can it wasn't berlin it wasn't venice it was you know those are pre prestigious and whatever but it's you know the screenings i had in palestine with my own audience and the reaction and the and the, then the conversation because that's you know that's what that's what 
cinema does for me is that we we have to it's it's for us and it's to push ourselves and to get ourselves to you know to 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 challenge ourselves to ask ourselves questions and to figure out our way together that's that's more interesting um for me is 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 my own audience um and that doesn't mean that you know when i when i make films i have a very specific audience in mind which is you know my own people but being able to speak to a much larger audience and being able to go beyond borders i mean that's what art is that's what art should be is that you know there are no borders and that you know that i think the more specific you are um you know and the more honest you are the film naturally speaks to to a to a bigger um to an, to a wider audience it becomes universal in its specificity um but when it's you know the other way it's i don't know it seems it it, it does uh it does you know fail somehow um I wanted to say something else. I'd like now. I've, I've also forgot. It's the, I guess it's it's the, it's the age um, as well. But uh, well, feel free to jump in with it if you remember. But uh, I mean, I think you know Suzanne's point is very well taken. I think we could even uh, take it back further and think about the kind of broader trajectory of Palestinian artists, particularly those who are who've done the work in terms of documenting the Palestinian experience. Going, Oh, please. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, because it went back to your initial, your original question, which is that as an artist, I also think, I don't think anything is going to, I don't think Palestinian film cinema, you know, as a filmmaker, I, as a, you know, I don't think, and, and someone who runs, you know, like cultural programs, I mean, someone who mentors and someone who teaches, I don't think cinema is going to change anything at all. Um, I, I think, because you asked about, you know, uh, what is going to make a difference in Palestine is like when Israelis are forced to give up the occupation of other human beings. There's no film that is going to change that. There's no novel that's going to change that. There's no, I mean, I think it's naive when people think like that this is going to be, it. the only thing is like a real effort of power to lift us, get the fucking boot off our neck. That's going to what's go, what is going to change, and that's where where you know justice is going to come about. It's not going to come from our from our films. I'm Marie, how does the boot boot get lifted? Who who puts the, the boot gets lifted with economic pressure? The boot gets lifted. You, I mean, something get, really first, solid, yes, not from our get, films. How do you get that economic I mean, pressure? I, how do you get that economic I, pressure? How do you get people? I mean, to we can look at it. We can look at it as parallel. I mean, not, not to sell yourself short in terms of the power of artists. I mean, think about something like Exodus, right? That this an entire generation of Americans was raised on a narrative that really fed into American support for Zionism in a way, right? That between the book and, and the film, this was something that you can say, I mean, it was sort of spoon fed to such a degree that American support for Zionism became something that was just taken for granted from that point forward. And I think in that sense, there is room for that to be added to everything else that we see in terms of the political, economic and, and so forth. So I, I think these things have to be seen as sort of working in tandem with one another, at least I, I don't know if, um, if you would agree with that, but in terms I do, of also I do agree with that. But America was already Zionist when when Exodus was, you know, it was already, you know, politically clear, you know, where it was going and what who it supported and why. I mean, there were there were there was, that was already there, um, and I do agree. Everything was, everything was in tandem. I just you know. <laughs> South Africa was not liberated because of, you know, yes, the arts have an effect, but South Africa was not liberated because of filmmakers or because of artists. You know, it's, it's, it was liberated because there was pressure. They were forced to give up their, their power. And nobody gives up power, as we know, willingly. They only give up power when they're forced to. Yeah, but to, to be clear, I mean, even, even... Resistance art played a huge role, specifically in America, actually, in, in you know, uh, uh, ending apartheid South Africa. And even, you know, degrees in universities are, are dedicated to this because it had had such a profound effect on, on individuals in America and public opinion in America that then led to the public policy and the government policies that then were forced 
to put the pressures. Do you see what I mean? It's very connected, actually, I think. And, and White South Africans were out. left out. That's where boycott worked. White South Africans understood they were alone. Yes, they but had to give it up. Because the world galvanized ultimately to put those pressures. So how do you get the world to galvanize? In a and million ways. Of in course, one a million, million ways. ways. But it's which, not a film. It's not a South African course. film that did that. Not. It's not. That's what that's the point. It's heard, everything. No. It's education. It's the, I mean, it's every it's every single thing that everybody can do exactly. in their way. Exactly. I think you guys are saying. I think you're all. I think you're on the same page. It is connected. Um, uh, you know, I think I do think art, um, literature, and film, and music, and dance, and food. I think they have a huge impact. Culture has a course, has yeah. power um, to you know. To, it has a power to, to, to put our, to put, you know, to stake our claim as human beings, as a connected society, no doubt. Um, and it's also, uh, it's also completely um, ineffective without tandem struggles, without all the people, the people whose names we don't know, and we're never going to know who put their bodies on yeah. the line, yeah. who, um, it, you know, it's, it's in the small gestures of activists around the world, of uh, activists within Palestine, whether it's 48 or Gaza or Jerusalem or, or the West Bank. I mean, so all of these things do work in tandem. I don't think that art um, and artistic expressions and all their forms should be discounted in terms of their power. Um, but but the, that power comes in the aggregate. Um, and, uh, and it is, and in that way, you're right, Emery, because there, there is no one film, there is no one thing. Exodus um, came, Exodus basically allowed Americans to, um, to pursue what they already wanted to pursue, Zionism. They wanted to feel good after uh, you know, uh, uh, after seeing images of the of of the Jewish Holocaust, they wanted a happy ending, and that's what. Ex so Exodus came in a ripe uh, in a ripe moment that allowed people to consume it because they were waiting for it. They that you know they America was already Zionist. It was already leaning the way it wanted. And on that, I I actually want to um, bring up another. Uh, uh, cultural um, something, I don't even know the word for it, that's coming up um, that I fear is going to be on par with Exodus. Um, so, you know, Israel's always, Israel understands the power of culture and, and uh, Exodus was commissioned um, by Zionists in order to basically, you know, sort of put forth the narrative that they wanted. We have been successful in changing that narrative over time, over decades of struggle, of artistic uh, uh, productions, of, uh, of struggle on the ground, activism around the world. And, and we've given, you know, we've showed the Israeli narrative to be a lie. And of course, it has shifted over time from, you know, from a land without a people, for people without a land, to terrorists, to whatever. But now it's the two-sidedism. It's the conflict. Um, it is a kumbaya moment. Um, it's just it's 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 a civil war kind of narrative that's that Israel is trying to replace now, uh, replace replace Palestinian struggle as an indigenous struggle with this conflict of two sides, and so we get books like a Paragon um, that that basically casts. Uh, uh, this colonial enterprise in light of, you know, two sides who just don't get along. And if they can just get together and love each other and talk to each other and see each other's humanity, everything will be fine. And so this is the narrative, of course, it's written by a white European man, uh, even though he's Irish, but it's, it's, it's what, it's what gets sort of put forth in and all for 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 the literary uh, in the literary establishment, it, it's you know it's nominated for awards, and uh, and Steven Spielberg is now yeah, going to make a film out of it. Steven Spielberg, so, right? So it's going to now be a big blockbuster film. And this, so of all of all of the the brilliant Palestinian uh, uh, writers and filmmakers 
um, who have produced authentic narratives. This is, it's no accident that this is the one that is chosen for a big Hollywood blockbuster film. Uh, and that's what, that now is what is going to be put forth um, to, to international audiences as, as the contemporary narrative. And I, so, so yeah, so, so art, so culture and artistic expression is, is hugely powerful and hugely impactful. Um, and, and it goes in both ways. So I think that this, this, that I think that book has done damage and I think the film will do damage. It's uh, back a bit, just a bit uh, back. It's uh, the, the whole question about um, um, if art's going to change a thing, it shouldn't be a yes or no question. It's just as, as you said, I really like the quote, always Tupac's line that uh, he's not going to change the world, but he's going to spark the minds that will change the world. I'm sure that, I don't know, whoever's going to make the revolution, the militant revolution or the, 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 the boycott revolution, I'm sure he's going to quote a song or quote a movie line, or it's it's there, it's effective in a way. So um, <laughs> I just don't, I hope they quote me, but I'm just saying in general. And so it, it just shouldn't be a yes or no question, that's it. You know, Susie, to go back to the, that's, you know, who gets to tell our stories? It's, 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 I don't, I don't, I haven't read the book that you're, you're referring to, but I know that in, in Palestine, you know, one of, one of our struggles is who gets to tell our stories. Um, and it's, you know, uh, you know, going back to the whole checkpoint genre of, you know, the checkpoint films, you know, there, there are so many checkpoint films by Israelis and they were really successful. They were, they were, you know, they were, big on the festival circuits they they did really well and i'm and it there's something you know people said oh you know people really like this and look they're really critical they're critical of the occupation like it's a good thing right and i said well, yeah but you know i i have i always say you know but how were they able to make these films how how come they got to make those films and Palestinians in Palestine can't make their films. How does a guy be, you know, go into, you know, crossing, you know, there was a film called Checkpoint about 10, 15 years ago um, that was, that did really well by an Israeli filmmaker. And that film was lauded. Um, it got so much praise and it showed the ugly, you know, ugly side of, you know, occupation. Um, and the guy who made the film was able to make that film because he is Israeli and he's able to go through our checkpoints and in and out. And he's able to film when we're not allowed to film. We get shut down. He stood at a checkpoint and he, he filmed people, Palestinians standing there and, you know, undergoing all the, all the humiliation and abuse of checkpoints. But did they have any say in that? I mean, they're sitting there and they're standing, you know what it is when you stand in those lines and you're powerless. And then there's, there's a guy with a camera filming you. And I mean, these are the questions that, you know, you have to ask, how come this is, you know, an Israeli filmmaker gets to go into our prisons and make, you know, stories about our, you know, our political prisoners or whoever we can't get there. We're not allowed in our prisoners. We can't even get to each other. We can't even get to our aunt's house in Jerusalem. I mean, we can't do anything. And I, I, I think it's, it's, it's something to, to, to always, you know, keep in mind and, and keep centered that it's, you know, who is telling our, our stories? Why do they get to tell our stories? And again and again, coming back to, you know, the, 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 the Palestinian filmmakers and artists and writers and musicians who are, you know, not able, who are, who are because of the reality of their lives you know, are not able to do, and how can, you know, you know, how can we center those stories more and more and, 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 you know, get them, get them out there. Mute. So if I, if I could just ask about, um, you know, the, the adaptation, that process for mornings in Janine. I don't know, Suzanne, if you want to talk about sort of what your vision is in terms of wanting to see your 
uh, you know, your brilliant novel put into a different medium and sort of why you think that this, you know, this, this is the sort of way that you'd like to see the story kind of retold now. And maybe for Anne-Marie, if you could talk to us a little bit about sort of what your vision is for, for bringing it to life, um, you know, on the screen. Um, well, first of all, I feel like it's in, uh, in safe and brilliant hands with Amory and, um, you know, one of the, uh, and, and we, we, we already talked offline and, um, you know, one of the things that was really important to me, uh, was that this film be done by a Palestinian, um, that, uh, uh that the writers be Palestinian, that, um, especially, you know, that, that the boss of the film and Marie be not just Palestinian, but somebody whose politics I respect, who, um, uh, who I trust is not going to make a film to appease anyone. Um, but is just going to be, uh, true, uh, true to the novel, true to, um, to our reality. And, and, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm excited. I mean, it's kind of, you know, the novel was my baby, but um, the, the the series is going is Anne Marie's, and um, and I'm excited about the collaboration. Of course, I'm. Yeah, we. You know, we can't really say much about it because we're. You know, it's we're not there yet. But <laughs> um, I'm so excited uh, about it as well. Obviously. Um, and I, I watched recently, it's a series, but it's uh, by Mira Nair called A Suitable Boy. I don't know if anyone's watched it yet. Um, Mira Nair, is, who is a great you know, filmmaker from, from India, and she, um, she did a series on, an, on a novel, um, an Indian novel. And I just smiled watching it because I just got excited that you know this Indian director is directing something that an Indian novelist wrote a novel that was so much loved and so popular um, in India and also internationally in the same way, you know, Mornings in Janine um, is so, you know, everywhere I go, people, you know, people have read this, you know, Palestinian and non-Palestinian, Mornings in Janine that had a, had a real profound effect on, on people. And I hope that I, you know, can, it can do it justice. Um, but I bring up Mira Nair's film because when series film, whatever, I don't know what it is. It's a six part, you know, one hour, it's like one hour, six, one hour films. I mean, it's immense. Um, but you really feel when you watch it, the profound, deep, deep love that she has, um, and her crew has, and her cast has, and the writer has for their country. Um, and with all its difficulties, with all the ugly sides, with all that, everything that it is, there's this huge heart there. I was watching a heart beating and I, and I, I, this is what I, you know, I'm excited about for, for the, the collaboration with, um, with Susie. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's what we're all about anyway. I mean, this is all about, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, this group, I mean, Tamar and I go way back. You know, he brought up Salt of the Sea. He he has a part in Salt of the Sea. We we met, you know, way back when we were we were all first, you know, starting he out. Chopping yeah. batata. <laughs> he was a he was chopping batata. He also did the soundtrack, the closing dead, you know. Um, you know, Frank and I, you and I have uh, you know, we have history together. And with of course with Farah and and the present. And and I want to say you know, it's all about you know, our connections and our collaboration and, and, and we are all connected and we're all helping each other out. And, and, you know, the present, you know, for me, you know, to, 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 to come back to, to the present, you know, with, with all the success it had um, and the Oscars and the BAFTA and everything for me, what it, what it really represents is that the present represents and, you know, it, it speaks to is the generosity of the Palestinian film industry. That is what it is. It, it, what it, it, you know, a, 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 like star group of people came together 
to help somebody do something, to help Farah get her vision, make her vision without expecting anything in return. And, and nobody expected that, you know, we don't do things because we think they're going to go to the Oscars. That's like, you know, the cherry on the cake and whatever, who cares about the Oscars anyways, and, you know, fuck Hollywood and all that stuff that, you know, we say when we're, you know, being punk rock, that's all great stuff. But the fact is, what is important about that film and all our works is that we are, we are a unit. We are, we really are a unit. And I really believe that. I, I feel that. Yeah, I, I feel it. And it's just, um, it, it's, it's a joy getting this opportunity to, to be with artists and um, that I, that I admire and appreciate. I sort of feel like this is a, a pretty sort of beautiful end to, to this conversation. But what do you think, Abdullah? Should, should you, um, it's, would you want each like to maybe sort of wrap up and we can give you each like a minute or two or something to say, um, to say something? Um, I mean, a lot has been said. So um, we're not going to ask you like in 30 seconds to say what do you think is going to bring whatever freedom to Palestine, but if you have any, any thoughts or you do know how you do. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, um, I think, I think we should just have time or just give us a bit of, you know, music before we, <laughs> <laughs> so he's saying to rap in W and you're saying rap without the W. Yes. <laughs> if you'd like to. Wow. <laughs> No, thank you. I think it was a beautiful ending as well, actually, what Amory said. So, you know, I don't I have a huge amount to add. I just think keep telling our stories the best way we know how. Our narrative has been hijacked. And, uh, and, and you know, there's a, a very powerful African proverb, until the lion learns how to write, the story will always glorify the hunter. And I think everyone here is a lion. So, great. That's it. I think... Sorry, I just want to say that, um, you know, I, I feel like we as both as individuals and as social collectives are, we're made of our stories. I mean, that's, that's what makes us who we are. Um, and if you consider on an individual level, like Alzheimer's disease or something, the, the devastation of it is that it dismantles a person's stories. And, and I think, um, you know, this is something uh, Israel's trying to be our Alzheimer's disease. I mean, they are trying to erase our collective memory. They have done this through physical destruction of, of our villages, of our cemeteries, um, of our homes, um, and uh, 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 physical destruction of our forests and our rivers. And... Um, uh, but and they do it in other ways through you know sort of disconnecting us from uh, from each other by silencing us by undermining our art. But I think that you know art Palestinian artists um, and that doesn't that's not just us. It's not just you know rappers and filmmakers and novelists. But it's you know it's uh, it's it's all the women. Um, who, you know, who pass on the skills of Tatris, who pass on, you know, cooking traditions, who, who pass on botanical indigenous knowledge, um, the, the glass blowers in Hebron, the, you know, the ceramic makers. I mean, th this is a huge, uh, we, have the, we have a huge cultural landscape um, that is ancient and indigenous. And and that's I, that's a really important ground. It's a really important terrain uh, to to cultivate and to to nurture and and reforest, you know. And uh, and and Israel has been trying to to colonize that. They have been trying to colonize this, you know, the, the terrain of our imagination and the terrain of our memory. Um, and I think it's I think that's where you know our resistance occurs um in 
and just producing art and, and, and loving our people, loving our history, loving our land and our traditions um, and appreciating each other. And I think that's, um, for me, that's, that's the beauty of being a cultural worker. Even though the whole uh, thing was mostly about movies, um, uh, but um, I still think that um, I still think that the whole change comes when there is um, I wouldn't say unity, but communication. And I would ne I would have never dreamt in 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 the age of fifteen, sixteen, that the communication will lead me to people who lives in, in who are staying in, in, in you said DC right uh, or, or in the UK or uh, and, and Marie in between places and so it's just this communication every day just makes me feel the power of, of my art if, if I wasn't doing art I wouldn't be communicating this way uh, and you know it's, it's, it's communicating and meeting and doing stuff it just feeds you every day with information and inspiration. So, uh, yeah, art is not going to change the world, but it changed my world, and I'm, I'm good with that. So. And Marie, final yeah. thoughts? Um, you know, yeah, no, I, everybody said everything so so eloquently. I, I guess I just, yeah, you, you know, communication, is, it's interesting, Tamar, and... You know, this unity that we were talking about at the start of this conversation, you know, that this, this, you know, new, you know, the, the latest, you know, um, violence in, in Palestine against Palestinians. Um, well, it's, you know, people talk about the, the unity that it created, but, you know, we've always been united. I, we've never not been united. Um, it's, it's every, every time we've, we've been united, even though all, all forces try to try to keep us apart from each other. And so I, I, um, I think people become less afraid, um, at different periods in, in history and, and less afraid to, to, to speak out. And we're seeing that moment right now that, um, at this particular moment, people, uh, especially the younger generation are, are not afraid. And I have a lot of hope. Um, despite how bad it is, I, I I have a lot of hope, and I and and that inspires me. And I and uh, I know that uh, we will see an end to to this regime in in our lifetime. Thank you, guys. I'll let you wrap up. I, I love the dog. The dog, perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> here another dog somebody else has a dog here is that you Tamit? it's my dog and the neighbor's dog they're just writing a song i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i'm waiting for the collaboration um, i wanted to say by the way uh um uh, suzanne and marie mabrook on, on the adaptation yes i would love to watch it thanks it's not final. Nothing's final, but it's exciting. It's just yeah. everyone as well. Uh, uh, Don't hold your breath. There's a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. And, and the movie and everything. So I, I, I sorry. Didn't, yeah. Mabrook and nominations on a movie on Netflix. I didn't have the chance to say that. So I'm. Sorry. Yes, Mabrook Farah. Yeah, this has been an, uh, just an absolute joy and an honor and a privilege. Thank you all so much. It's so great to be with you. Um, and I, I do hope we have these kinds of opportunities to do future conversations again. Uh, if you're ever in, in Doha, please come to the Georgetown campus. We'd love to, to host you there as well. Um, I know my students there have, have all followed your work as well. And so they're all very excited about today's, today's event. Um, I think with that, we can uh, say goodbye.